Bununla ilgili olarak airstrikes with no cooperation with the ground forces will not do the job alone. Moderate opposition should be trained and equipped. Welcome back to the heat. That was President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey calling for the use of ground troops to defeat militants with Islamic State. Well, joining us now from California is Dalia Dasa K. She is the director of the Center for Middle East Public Policy and a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation. And from London, we're joined by Dr. Azam Tamimi. He's the chairman of the London-based Al Hiwar television channel. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Dr. Tamimi, let me start with you. The United States and its allies are now taking on ISIL in Syria and Iraq. President Obama has gone to great lengths to assure people that this is a war against a bunch of terrorists, not a war against Islam. Is he winning that argument? Uh, I don't think so. I think among many Muslims, this is perceived as another um, Western uh, onslaught uh, uh, on Muslims. Uh, this does not necessarily mean that uh, those who uh, carry that view uh, support uh, ISIL, uh, but because we've uh, seen the uh, results of uh, airstrikes before in uh, Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, uh, it is mostly the innocent uh, who suffer as a result, and uh, these campaigns don't usually result, uh, don't, don't uh, uh, end up in resolving the problem. Dalia, I was looking at a piece that you wrote in the New York Times that ISIL is seen largely as a Sunni group, and the way to tackle this group is to actually form a Sunni-based anti-ISIL group. Uh, how will that be done, and do you think it's likely? Well, I do think that's what we already see underway. I think the Obama administration uh, rightly understood uh, that it needed Sunni allies, both in the Arab world and, of course, Turkey, uh, to support this effort against ISIL, ISIS, uh, because it really is important that it's not perceived as America fighting uh, the Sunni Muslim world and that we are not uh, de facto supporting and strengthening uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria and his allies Iran and of course uh, Iran is in the Shia side of the Muslim world so I think it was the right strategy to approach our Sunni partners to try to support us in this effort uh, but I also argued in that piece it will be very difficult to sustain this coalition I think w you know Syria is a particularly weak link in this uh, effort and here's where we really see the fissures among our coalition allies, uh, because priorities are different, and their priorities are more focused on getting rid of Bashar al-Assad, and U.S. priorities and Western priorities are more focused on fighting Islamic extremism in the group of ISIS, al-Nusra, and others who are interested in attacking the West. So again, I think it's an important uh, move to build this coalition. It's already underway, but I think it's going to be very difficult to sustain, and it's already tenuous. Dr. Tamimi, at its very basic level, is this a fight between the two uh, Islamic, uh, at least the two branches of Islam, you know, the Sunni branch and the Shia fight, and the Shia branch? Well, it has, uh, uh, it has uh, given this impression in certain places, but uh, in essence, it's not that. It's not a fight between Sunnah and Shia. Uh, it's uh, rather a struggle uh, for a better future for the region. And the problem is that uh, the United States of America and its Western allies continue to ally themselves uh, with despotic, uh, corrupt regimes in the region. So this is not uh, uh, about uh, a Sunni war against ISIL or a Sunni-Shia conflict. This is about uh, a struggle by the peoples of the region uh, against despotic regimes. And uh, I am one of uh, many people who thought that with the coming of the Arab Spring, uh, we were going to rid ourselves of uh, Al-Qaeda and all forms of extremism uh, as we were getting rid of uh, despotic regimes. But unfortunately, as democracy was aborted, and with the consent of the uh, Western powers, uh, we saw uh, the reincarnation of even a worse form uh, of Al-Qaeda in the shape of ISIL. So it's, for me, a question of uh, political reform, uh, a, trans a, a genuine uh, transformation from despotism to democracy, uh, that uh, should uh, uh, resolve this problem. Right, Delia, the United States makes much of the fact that this war that it's fighting against ISIL is not a war that the United States is conducting against ISIL. It's a coalition, and that coalition, most importantly, includes Arab states. But are the Arab states in the region really on board? Uh, 
Right, I think that's a great question, and your other guest, I think, raised a very important point, which is this is a coalition with Arab leaders. That does not mean that Arab populations are fully behind this. And I think there are a lot of concerns that the U.S. and our partners in the West are paying some bit of a price uh, with these partnerships in terms of um, sweeping other issues under the rug, uh, democratic reforms, human rights, and so forth, because we feel we need these Sunni Arab states on our side. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think, accurate concern uh, and legitimate concern, but there is a feeling that right now this is a crisis. You have an extremist group taking over large swaths of territory in Iraq and Syria, uh, extremist ideology threatening not just the United States, but many people in the region, enormous refugee flows because of this, over three million Syrians now displaced tremendous pressures on all the neighboring states. This is not just an American crisis, this is a regional crisis. So I think that the feeling is we need to, at least in the short term, get some of these partners on, on board to stem, stem the flow and contain this problem. But I, I would agree, I, I don't think we completely have them on board in terms of a long-term strategy because, as I said before, I think our priorities and objectives are ultimately different, especially when it comes to Syria. I think there we, the United States, is very focused on degrading the capabilities of ISIS, and our allies are very much interested in the overthrow of the Assad regime, which so far the administration has tried to stay out of injecting itself in that civil war for over three and a half years. But it's going to get more and more difficult to do uh, now that the U.S. committed to airstrikes in this arena. So I, I don't think we have them fully on board. I think the, uh, the situation with the Turks right now is a perfect illustration of the fissures you see in this coalition and the different priorities of our partners. And this is only going to get worse as this effort um, is, is going to be quite lengthy. And if U.S. successes are not apparent in the short term, I think we're going to start losing or getting more pushback from some of our partners. Dr. Tsbimi, uh, do we have any idea of what Arab public opinion is like? Uh, Dalia raises the great point there that the leaders of these countries may want to be on board, be with the United States, but their populations are not. And we often hear this term, the Arab street. Is the Arab street on board? Well, Arab uh, public opinion is difficult to gauge nowadays uh, because of the uh, turmoil that is uh, sweeping across the region. Of course, there are uh, intellectual voices, and these intellectual voices are divided. Uh, uh, but I would say that uh, generally the uh, Arab public uh, perceives with skepticism uh, uh, any alliance uh, between Western powers and despotic regimes who are considered to be the root, uh, uh, the root cause of, uh, of the problem we are uh, having uh, uh, at the moment. Um, uh, ISIS uh, would never have uh, uh, come into existence, would never have uh, grown and expanded uh, so rapidly had it not been for the prolonging of the crisis in Syria and had it not been for the uh, failure of the Iraqi regime. These two factors uh, led to the uh, emergence of ISIS and its expansion. Uh, Dalia, how big a threat does ISIL pose to uh, what are seen as moderate governments in the Middle East, in the region, governments like the one in Jordan or, say, Saudi Arabia? or uh, governments in the Gulf, the United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. Qatar to some extent? Yeah, well, I think they pose a significant threat, which is why you see these Arab partners openly uh, touting their uh, partnership in this anti-ISIS coalition. They are very nervous. ISIS uh, does not view any of these governments as legitimate rulers. Uh, they have quite a bit of sympathy, again, among these populations who feel marginalized, um, and uh, you know, this is particularly the case among Sunnis in Iraq, but even in countries like Jordan, uh, Lebanon, a lot of feeling of marginalization, frustration with uh, corruption, governance, and so forth, ISIS really feeds off of this broader landscape and I think is a very worrying uh, threat for the leaderships of these countries. Uh, and ISIS has shown it has regional ambitions, territorial ambitions, uh, so neighbors like Jordan, Lebanon, um, the Gulf states are, of course, further, but, uh, but in terms of ISIS capabilities to, um, to pro promote terrorism and other forms of instability are, are a serious threat. So I think it's, it's not that surprising that these leaders have signed on because they really do see this as a serious threat. You know, that said, again, I think their ultimate interest is getting rid of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that 
our Arab partners are not launching airstrikes in Iraq. They're launching airstrikes in Syria. So I think at a certain point, there's going to be an interest in seeing the U.S. get more ambitious in its goals of what it's trying to achieve in Syria. So while the concern is definitely there about ISIS, and, and that's why you have this coalition in the first place, again, over time, I think these concerns over getting rid of Assad, um, ultimately because it is supported uh, by the Iranians, by the Russians, and this is, this is a broader geopolitical power struggle. It's not just about sectarianism. Uh, this is going to be a real challenge for this coalition over time. Dr. Tamimi, if the United States is going to get more ambitious about this, does it start talking to the government in Tehran, start talking to the Iranians, and to some extent try to come to some kind of a deal with Bashar al-Assad in Syria as well? Well, people in the region talk a lot about uh, uh, America uh, and American-Iranian uh, communication, that these communications sometimes take place uh, in public, but uh, more often uh, uh, in private. And the uh, uh, fact that the Americans have been silent about what went on in Yemen uh, when the Houthis, who are uh, uh, acting on, uh, on the behest of the Iranians and uh, managed to sweep across the uh, capital, Sana'a, that this was met with silence from America and its Western alliance, that this was seen as some sort of uh, uh, consent by the West uh, to what's uh, going on, as if uh, people assume uh, that, that, that there is some sort of uh, a back dealing between the Iranians uh, and the, the Americans. Also, the refusal of the Americans right from the beginning of the crisis in Syria uh, to accept, for, for instance, Turkish proposals for the creation of uh, uh, buffer zones uh, for the refugees, for uh, a no-fly zone. Uh, all this shows that uh, uh, the Americans are uh, uh, once again uh, seeing their interests best served by the continuation of a, of, an, uh, of a weak Assad regime rather than the removal of that regime. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Next, more on the military operation now underway against ISIL. Stay with us. You're on the heat.